Hello world, it's Siraj, and today I want to show you how to mint an NFT, that is a non-fungible token, on the Ethereum blockchain using a sidechain called Polygon. And I have a demo right here for you. What I've done is I've minted my own genome. This is a genome that I sequenced using a service called 23andMe, and I minted it on the Ethereum blockchain using Polygon on this marketplace called OpenSea. And I don't expect anybody to buy this. I just, it's, this is more just like a demo. I listed it for one ether. Uh, if somebody wants to buy it, go ahead, but I don't think anybody's gonna buy it. The point of this video is to show you how to do the same because we are just at the beginning of this NFT revolution. Right now, dogs and cat images and pixel art, these things are considered NFTs, but in the future, we're gonna get voting rights, we're going to get all sorts of applications, entire corporations, physical property, houses, cars, personhood, everything is going to become an NFT in the future. And the focus of this video is to show you how to mint your own NFT for free using these technologies and how we can use this in healthcare to help preserve and provision patient data for providers and such. Okay, so this is a demo of this. This is, you can see my genome here. I visualized it using Python. It's got an image, it's listed on OpenSea. And whoever owns this NFT will get the actual genome TXT file as an unlock. So that's the whole part of it. I'm going to show you all the bits that I'm going to be talking about here. But as you can see, I've minted it using a smart contract on the Polygon chain. And you can see that uh, it shows that I am, in fact, the owner of this. If I look at the owner, here's the contract address. And I can see the actual file here. It's saved on the Interplanetary File System, or IPFS. And you can see that if I take that and I look in the IPFS viewer, uh, you can see that I have it right here. There it is on IPFS. This is essentially an HTTP gateway into the Interplanetary File System, which is a decentralized file store. There's a lot that we're gonna go into this video. Shout out to Rapid API for sponsoring this video. We're gonna also look at how we can use Rapid API to visually search for different NFTs, all right? So the first thing I wanna to get to here is what are NFTs? Okay, so NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Fungible assets, tokens, are things that can be exchanged one-to-one. -one. So it's a dollar, a Bitcoin, an Ether, all of these are fungible. That means that I can exchange a dollar for a dollar, a Bitcoin for a Bitcoin, these are fungible. Semi-fungible are things that could be traded one-to-one, -one, but they're not necessarily unique, like tickets, for example. Tickets, you know, I could have a ticket for seat A and you could have a ticket for seat B. These are non-fungible because they're different, they're different seats. However, if they're for the same seat, then they are interchangeable. So you can think of fungible as a synonym for inter interchangeable. Non-fungible means that it cannot be exchanged one-to-one. -one. That means there is only one single version of this, the Mona Lisa. That is a non-fungible painting. There is only one. Now, in the metaverse, as we are building it, the metaverse consists of crypto, Web3, virtual reality. All of these technologies are creating this new universe inside of the internet. We need some way of assigning patent rights to a single piece of digital property. That means data. Now, data is infinitely replicable. That means that if I have an image, a video, a text, audio, all of that can be repl replicated over and over and over again. But what an NFT does is it assigns it a unique token and it says that whoever owns this token owns this specific piece of it, owns this data. And you know this is a really hard concept to understand because it's very modern, right? Never before have there been this concept of digital property ownership. Usually a single piece of property like land or a painting, that is very clearly uh, non-fungible because you can't replicate land, you can replicate data. But what an NFT does is it gives that same uniqueness to a piece of digital property. And there's a whole ecosystem around this. NFTs are used for infrastructure, for domains, the ENS, the Ethereum name service, so unstoppable domains. It's used for marketplaces like OpenSea, games, right? So in-game purchases, in-game assets, items, armor, uh, swords, things like that. Those can be traded interchangeably um, as an NFT. And we're only at the very, very, very beginning. This is not hype. This is not some kind of uh, temporary thing. NFTs are not only here to stay, 
We're at the very, very beginning of this. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand what I mean when I say that. So uh, why is this useful? So NFTs are, like I said, proof of ownership and they're governed by code instead of by lawyers. And they're governed by code globally, right? So lawyers only apply to a specific country, whereas NFTs are governed by code, which are, even though gas is very expensive, that means the cost to mint an NFT is, is expensive, it's still much, much cheaper than a lawyer would be. And these are interoperable across different institutions. So you could trade, theoretically, an NFT of a piece of art for an NFT of, say, my genome. Right? You can't normally do that in the real world, but with NFTs, you can do that. And the most, one of the most exciting parts of all this is that creators are going to both retain ownership over their creations, like NFT artists, as well as being able to collect all of the revenue from some piece of NFT art. Right? So they don't have to actually share that revenue with the platform, they own all of that revenue. And there's actually a way to mint an NFT where a creator will get a percentage royalty every time that NFT is sold, and this can be specified programmatically in the initial minting contract. So what are some examples of NFTs? Well, my friend George Hotz made an NFT called CryptoKitties several years ago in 20, I think it was 2017. And so that was an NFT, but all of a sudden, nobody really talked about it as much as they are now. Now NFTs are very mainstream. And that's for several reasons, mainly because it's a lot easier to use the Ethereum blockchain due to what are called layer two solutions, and we'll go into that. Um, so CryptoKitties, those were digital collectibles. There's only one type of cat each. Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, minted an NFT of his first ever tweet, and it sold for some crazy amount of money. Grimes, um, who is a musical artist, sold her music videos on this NFT marketplace called Nifty Gateway. And you can see a bunch of her NFTs are all priced at very expensive amounts in USD here. Um, but that's just those are just some examples. But really what I think, what I find most exciting about NFTs is the ability to provide patients with ownership over their health data. So biomedical data, you know, your blood test, your, um, your, bio, your biomarkers, your medical imaging data, all of this, you can retain ownership of it if you turn it into an NFT and then you can sell it. And different institutions, researchers, hospitals, clinics, the more they use your NFT, the more they sell it to their providers and their partner networks, the more the patient will actually earn money. So you could think of this as a passive income, right? So the more you output your health data and the more people use it, institutions, the more you're gonna get paid. And this is an example of a very recent blockchain out of uh, the UAE called AI Metis. And essentially what they're trying to do is create a marketplace for health-related NFTs. This is an architecture of kind of what it looks like. There's a lot going on here, but essentially patients can turn NFTs into, uh, they can turn their health records into NFTs. They can turn a lot of things that are health-related into N NFTs and different providers can then buy those NFTs and the patient gets all of that money. So how, how does all this work? Well, we cannot talk about NFTs without talking about Ethereum. And Ethereum is a blockchain. It is the second most popular blockchain after Bitcoin. And in computer science terms, Ethereum is a cryptographically secure transactional singleton machine with shared state. That's a mouthful, I know, but let's explain what that means. What that means is that it is a digital currency that uses mathematical algorithms to ensure that it's nearly impossible to cheat the system. That means creating two of the same type of token. It's using math to prove trust instead of having to trust a third party. Now, when I say it's a state machine, that means that every transaction will transition the state of the entire network from one state to another. So every time a transaction happens, I send you money, you send me money, the Ethereum virtual state transitions to a new state. And that is inside of each state, there are millions and millions of transactions. And each of these transactions are grouped into what are called blocks. It's a chain of these blocks. And every time a transaction occurs, there's a validation process called mining that is processed in order to ensure that that transaction is valid. And Ethereum currently uses what's called proof of work mining. And here's an algorithm for proof of work. We're not gonna go into that because it's uh, quite intense. But there are two types of Ethereum accounts. The first is an externally owned account. That would mean an account that you or I own. 
And the second is a contract account. Now, these are two separate and distinct types of accounts. And an externally owned account has a private key and it has some money. A contract account holds, holds a piece of code. And this code can execute some sort of operation. And what we do is when we take an externally owned account like my own and I send a, and I send a transaction to a contract account, that contract account will then execute some code on what's called the Ethereum virtual machine. And why is this important? Because the Ethereum virtual machine is essentially a computer, not just any type of computer. It is an unstoppable, uncensorable computer because it's like a Hydra. If you cut off one of its head, three more will pop up. It is a network. It is not a server. It lives globally across hundreds of thousands of nodes across the world. And essentially this allows us to upload some code to a service like say Heroku, except it's decentralized. So it's unstoppable. And we could think of it, Ethereum, as essentially a computer. And the computer is called the Ethereum virtual machine. It's got its own memory, it's got its own storage, it's got its own code, and it's got its own language called bytecode. And when we write smart contracts, we use a language called Solidity, and this Solidity language compiles down to bytecode. It's essentially an unstoppable computer. And here is a very high level, very detailed diagram of what the Ethereum computer looks like. Before executing a particular computation, the Ethereum virtual machine's processor is going to make sure that the following information is available and valid. And you can see a list of this information, system state, the gas cost, which is the amount of money you have to pay for each computation, um, and all of this stuff, right? And some code, things like that. And so what the EVM will do once you initiate a transaction is it's going to compile and execute some code. It's got a stack, it's got memory, and it's got storage. And it's going to recursively compute all of these calls until it's complete, just like a normal virtual machine, just like a normal computer would. And, and so what this allows us to do is build applications that are unstoppable using these smart contracts. Now, Back a few years ago, a developer implemented a proposal called ERC-20. And what ERC-20 does is it allows developers to create tokens on top of Ethereum. So if you go to Coinbase or almost any exchange, you're going to see all of these tokens, and most of them are built on Ethereum. They're essentially Ethereum tokens, and they're renamed. And that's what Ethereum allows you to do. It allows you to create your own cryptocurrency, and all of it is built on top of Ethereum. Now, ERC-20 is a very popular protocol. Basically, it's a spec. It's, it allows you to create a token as long as you follow this specific set of naming conventions. So each token needs a name, it needs a symbol, it needs a decimal, it needs a total supply of that token, um, a balance of you know, a sender address, things like that, events for what happens when we transfer a token, et cetera. And you can see on the Ethereum website, we can create our own token by installing their Python package Web3 and then defining all of these features as the spec has laid out. And that'll essentially allow us to create a token. And remember, this is a smart contract. The smart contract will live forever on the Ethereum blockchain. And we can then have a token and do whatever we want with it. So that's the most popular type of token. More recently, there was another spec called ERC721. And this defines what's called a non-fungible token standard. This is what almost all NFTs are based off of. Just like ERC20, it has a set of methods that need to be implemented inside of your smart contract to comply with that spec. Um, these, these methods are related to NFT minting. And we can see, again, an example of how this works. And we've seen all sorts of applications of this. CryptoKitties is one, the Ethereum name service. We can have unstoppable domains and all sorts of games and things like that, art. So that's the idea behind NFTs and how these are based off of Ethereum mostly. There are also other blockchains like Solana, which are directly competing with Ethereum. But I like Ethereum because it's been around the longest. It's got the most developer activity. And I believe it has the smartest developers working on it to make it better and better over time. But Ethereum is not perfect. Ethereum suffers from a really big problem. And that problem is that it is congested as F. Basically, it is really expensive to mint an NFT on Ethereum, 
and there are way too many transactions happening. The network is slowing down, it's getting congested. And so a group of developers created something called Polygon. And Polygon is essentially a layer two solution that allows us to use the Ethereum blockchain, except not, but we don't have to deal with the high gas cost and the slow transaction times. Okay, so Polygon is essentially a fork of Ethereum Go, and they made all sorts of modifications to it to allow it to be able to do faster transactions with lower gas costs. And when it comes to scaling, blockchains generally offer two solutions. The first is to try and scale the main chain. We call that layer one. And if we do that, we have to sacrifice one of three things, scalability, security, or decentralization. It's called the blockchain trilemma. The alternative is to use a side chain that operates on top of the main chain and that offloads some of the work and hence this eases congestion on the main chain. So the Ethereum developers are currently trying to improve L1, layer one, with techniques like sharding and transitioning to proof of stake instead of proof of work. And that's ETH2. ETH2 is a process. It's gonna take a while. It's not gonna happen overnight. And we don't even know if it's gonna work, frankly. Polygon is a layer two solution, so it's its own blockchain. And basically what it allows developers to do and users is to perform fast, cheap transactions on the Ethereum blockchain using its own infrastructure, its own token, its own user nodes, its own validator nodes, its own native dApps. It's kind of how like Bitcoin is layer one. Bitcoin's layer two is called Lightning Network for faster transactions. And there are a lot of different ways that we can create solutions for layer two. There are these things called optimistic rollups. They're called, there are these things called zero knowledge rollups. There are things called plasma and state channels and validium. Um, so there's a lot of things we could go into to talk about how layer two works. But let's take it from Vitalik himself, the creator of Ethereum. He says, in the short term, I just don't, I just don't see rollups as being one choice among many things, I see them as being the only choice. So let's then talk about rollups specifically, which is what Polygon implements or will implement more and more in the future. Rollups are essentially solutions that perform executions as much as possible outside of the main Ethereum chain, but then post that transaction data to the layer one. And the most popular type or the one that's getting the most hype right now are called zero knowledge rollups. These are essentially many, many transactions that are happening off of a different chain, not the main chain, not the main Ethereum chain. Then a, a cryptographic proof is generated from them. This is a validity proof that says that, hey, these transactions are valid. And it's known as a SNARK, a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. Once that proof is generated, that proof is then posted back on layer one. And so the ZK rollup smart contract maintains the state of all the transfers on layer two. And this state can only be updated with the validity proof. So all of these transactions are happening on say the Polygon chain. They're, the, they're then rolled up into a small set of transactions posted on the main chain as a proof. And the main chain then says that, hey, th these transactions, even though they happened off the main chain, we can prove that they are valid transactions. And in this way, layer two solutions get the security of the Ethereum main chain, but they get the speed and throughput of a side chain. Okay, so that's the way Polygon works. I'm a, really, I'm a really big fan of Polygon. I think the work that they're doing is great. They've essentially just acquired a team called Hermes that's been working on these zero knowledge rollups, ZK rollups. And you can see here that, uh, you know, 90% transfer cost reduction, L1 Ethereum costs a lot of money, L2 Hermes, you know, very cheap. We have all of these transactions, you know, over 2000 transactions per batch to process, a validity proof, a zero knowledge proof is generated. And then that proof is posted to the main Ethereum chain to say, hey, these transactions are valid. And once Ethereum accepts those, then all of those transactions are indeed valid on the main chain. So that's essentially how Polygon works as a layer two solution. That's how Ethereum works. And that's what NFTs are essentially built on. Like I said, NFTs can also be built on different blockchains, but the most popular one is Ethereum. And that's why we're talking about it today. So what I wanna do is I wanna now visualize my genome using Python. We're going to create a visualization of it. Then we're gonna turn that image, that PNG file into an NFT. And we're gonna post it to the Ethereum blockchain using Polygon. So the first thing I'll do is I'll open up my genome file. You can see it here. 
Uh, basically, it is a collection of all of my genes, and each of them has a position. They have a chromosome, they have an allele one and an allele two. Um, both of these alleles make what's called a genotype, and I've got a lot of them. And I sequence them using a service called uh, Ancestry DNA. I thought it was 23andMe, it's actually Ancestry DNA. Now, we want to visualize all of these features into a single image because that would be pretty, that would be pretty to put inside of an NFT, don't you think? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use Python to do this. Um, I'll import pandas and CSV. Here's my genome, um, here's a CSV file. I'm gonna turn it into a CSV file, so let me run this code. Um, now it should be a CSV file, so I'll go ahead and say, hey, this data.csv file, I'm gonna use pandas to read it. And here's the CSV file. And let's say that I want to combine both of those alleles into a single genotype because I want fewer features. I don't want that many features. I only want three that I'll visualize in a three-dimensional graph. So I'll say, take that genotype and combine, combine both of those features into a single column and let me see what that looks like after I do that. So now I've got a new column called genotype and it's a, co it's a combination of both of these alleles. Okay, so now that I have that, I will, let maybe I can plot one of the alleles and see what that looks like using Seaborn. And you can see here that it's a bar graph of all the collection of T's, G's, C's, and A's that I have. DNA, this is the language of DNA. Um, these are the, these, this is the language of DNA, not ones and zeros, but T's, G's, C's, and A's. Now what I can do is I can turn all of this into a scatter plot. So let me paste my own code here. And once I do that, you can see that I'm going to take the genotype is the X coordinate, the chromosome is the Y, the position is a Z, plot the axes, and then here's, here we go. Here is my genotype in three dimensional form. Okay, so that's the visualization step. Here's my genome in a single image. Now we're going to save this image as my genome and we're gonna turn it into an NFT. So I'll say genome image to my desktop, boom, okay. So the first thing I wanna do is I will make a new directory called Polygon NFT. And I will CD into this directory. And I'm going to install a tool called Hardhat um, using NPM. Uh, permission was denied, so I will try it again. And Hardhat was installed, I think. Yes. What a Hardhat is, it is essentially a toolkit for Ethereum developers to build all sorts of smart contracts, run them on a test environment. Uh, it's pretty cool, Solidity locally. Solidity is the language of Ethereum, and it's pretty cool. So that's Hardhat. Looks like Hardhat is still installing, and now it's done installing. So I'm gonna create a basic sample project, um, and yes, 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 install, install. Permission was denied. Okay, and now if I go into my directory that I've just created, I'm gonna have several things. I'm gonna have this contracts folder. It's got a greeter.solidity file, which is a greeting. That's just a test thing. We've got some scripts here, a sample script. Um, this is essentially gonna deploy the contract using JavaScript. And then uh, I've got some, you know, some test JavaScript files as well. So what I will now do is I will create a file called env, um, and in this env file, I will set my private key to my polygon private key. And how am I gonna find that? The way I'm gonna find that is I'm going to use, look at my MetaMask browser here. And in MetaMask, which is a browser wallet essentially, I will Look at my account details, export my private key. Here's my private key. Doesn't matter, there's no money in there, so okay. I will then 
post my private key here, save it, and now I've got this private key. I'm going to install this package called .env that will be able to look in the .env file that I just created. And now I'm going to create, now I'm going to get some Matic from what's called a faucet. Um, so I can get some polygon, Matic is a different word for polygon, from this faucet that essentially spits out free Matic or polygon for me. And I have my Matic token, here's my, I can paste in my address, my public address for Matic, submit, confirm, sometimes it fails, you got to keep trying. Okay, I can view that in Polygon Scan. It just sent some money to my address. Now I have some money to play with. It'll show up in a little bit. There we go. Boom. Here's the, you know, I got basically less than a penny, but that's enough for this. So I've got that. So now we're going to install this Open Zeppelin. Now we're going to install what's called Open Zeppelin, which is essentially a smart contract library. We're going to create a very specific smart contract for minting an NFT. So if I go to Sublime, open that up again, um, I will create a new script. And here is the code for that. Probably just use this JavaScript wrapper so it looks nice. Um, so let's talk about what this is doing. Basically what this is doing is it's following that standard that I talked about earlier, ERC721, and it's implementing those methods. So we're gonna call this my NFT. Um, we're gonna set the token a unique address, and it's going to have a lot of meta, it's gonna have some address, some metadata. It's going to mint it using ERC721. And you know this is just an example, but we I found this contract code um, on the internet, we can just use this to mint an NFT. We can switch it to you know whatever we want to, and and if we use this service called Pinata, which is essentially a way to post images to IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, we can point the smart contract to this. Um, unique ID on IPFS. And the way we'll do that is we will create a new file called metadata.json. Nano metadata.json. And it will have a link to that image that I posted. And the contract is going to call that metadata.json using hardhat. And that's all going to happen in this deploy script. So we'll create one more deploy script. That's JavaScript. And that's going to attach that image on IPFS to that smart contract, NFT minting, that NFT minting smart contract. And once it's deployed, we can view it as well using this command. And we can see that I am the owner of this NFT now, okay? So this was with Polygon. Now, this was the hard way of doing things. Now I wanna show you the very easy way of minting an NFT, which doesn't involve code. I just wanted you to see behind the scenes how this works, okay? So the easiest way to do this, well, there are two easy ways. The first easy way is to go directly to OpenSea, and I'll create my own NFT on OpenSea. Now, normally this would cost a lot of money, but because OpenSea uses Polygon, we can do this for free because it's so cheap. So let's say I have some other image, let's say this gene expression image, and I'll call it genes, I will give it a description, genes image, I'll add it to some collection, and you know, there's a lot we can do here. Unlockable content is really interesting. I can say, you know, whoever owns this NFT then gets access to you know, some file. So I can have some drive link or something, some Dropbox link, some IPFS link, where whoever buys it then gets access to what is attached to that, which is super cool. 
there's a lot we can do here. Um, but let's say I don't actually want that. And I'm, I can choose a supply. And if it's Ethereum, it's going to be uh, somewhat expensive. If it's Polygon, it's actually going to be uh, gas free. So it's actually free for us. And we create and boom, we have an NFT that is minted on the blockchain and it's available for anyone to buy on OpenSea. You can see it right there. Here it is. Easy. Okay. Now, there's also Rapid API. We can look at Rapid API as a way of viewing uh, different NFTs visually. So Rapid API is a collection of different APIs. If we look at NFTs, if we search for an NFT API, we can see that there is a way to visually search for NFTs using images, which is awesome. And, and that essentially allows us to look for NFTs using images and you know, if we wanna look for NFTs, we can do that using this API. We can test it out in the browser using Python. We can see the JSON returned as well. Um, it's all done very well right here in the browser, which is awesome. The parameter would be the URL, the image we wanna return, and we can see what NFTs already exist. So I hope you found this video useful. Shout out to everybody out there who's building their own Web3 applications and platforms and helper tools. I know I couldn't make, could not have made this video without their help. So thank you. I've got a bunch of helpful links for you in the video description to build your own NFTs on Ethereum, on Polygon, to learn more about how we can use healthcare data to generate passive income for users. If you're interested, please subscribe for more programming videos. And for now, I've got to go mint myself and my own personhood. So thanks for watching.